All right, pretty cool feature. Knowing one little formula, you can look at survey results and pretty much help decide whether it's a reasonable result or not, how accurate it is. Surveys are usually conducted, and most of the time they're trying to learn about a proportion. What proportion are going to go out and vote in that election? What proportion are in favor of the president's latest statement that he made? What proportion have a certain characteristic? And that population proportion, the proportion of people who have that trait, the population proportion is represented by P. That's the population proportion. They want to learn about the true proportion of all registered voters who actually vote. So P represents the population proportion in a survey a sample survey is usually conducted to try to estimate that. So when they actually get their data and they look at the proportion in their sample that said, yes, I plan to vote or I agree with that statement, they're not getting the true proportion necessarily. They're getting an estimate. It's called the sample proportion. And it's represented by P with a hat over it. That's one way to denote it. Pretty common representation. Just like last week we were doing mu and X bar, the population mean and the sample mean. This is the population proportion and the sample proportion. The population proportion parameter, the sample proportion being a statistic. Turns out, of course, that you would like to know how close is P hat to P. How close is the sample proportion that they're reporting in that survey to the true proportion? Well, if you knew the true proportion, so you could say how close it is, you wouldn't need to take a sample survey to begin with. But we would like to be able to convey to readers of that set of results how accurate our process is. How close do you expect a sample proportion to be to the true proportion if you design the survey this way? And that's what they do report. Have you ever seen the phrase margin of error when people are reporting a scientific survey results? Usually it's at the bottom like a plus and minus 3%. It's a pretty common one. Because a lot of surveys are conducted with about 1,000 subjects. Survey of size 1,000. The margin of error is the upper limit, the upper bound, for how far away you'd expect your sample answer to be from the truth for most of the samples. 95% of the samples would give you an answer that is within this amount from the truth. It's called a 95% margin of error, and it's a simple calculation for proportions. I say, students, you know, we have lots of formulas. We'll figure out where that comes from, but if you just remember 1 over square root of n as your margin of error to look at surveys, and they tell you 500 people were surveyed, you can calculate the margin of error, even if they didn't report it. 1 over square root of n. And so that is often reported so that you can take your best guess from the survey, and the survey 60% said yes. And you can go out your margin of error each way and say there's a range of values that are quite reasonable for that proportion in your population, and even use that to decide if you think you have a majority or not. One over square root of n. Let's try it out. We have poll results from 1,250 adults. And they asked them a lot of questions about the American school system, kind of giving it a grade. One of the questions was, in general, how would you rate the quality of the American public schools? And this is the results for the options that they were given. 462 said excellent. 288 of these 1,250 adults that were surveyed said pretty good. So this is our variable, school qual quality. What kind of response variable do we have here? What type? So the main variable of interest for this question anyway, so it's playing the role of a response variable, and its type would be what? Categorical or quantitative? Categorical. Excellent, pretty good. It does have an ordering to it, so you could say it's ordinal too. Categorical, so if I asked you to take the count data there and make me a nice summary, First of all, I would hope you would convert those counts to be proportions. And then perhaps maybe make a picture that would show me how the different categories compare, which would be a what? Bar graph, bar chart. That would be a good choice. You could do a pie chart. 
that would be just fine. The pie doesn't always necessarily preserve the ordering like you could in a bar chart where you'd have you know, excellent over here and then whichever way you go from not so great to up to great. So you can see that comparison more readily, but either would be sufficient. All right, so let's work out what proportion of our sampled adults said excellent. What is that rate going to be? So what do we have? 400 and 62. This does total to the 1,250. There were a few that said not sure, but that's still part of the base here. And so what is 462 divided by 1250? We have 30, about 36, 37 percent. 0.3696, how about 0.37 or 37 percent? About 37 percent of our surveyed adults would rate the schools as excellent. What if you were to do this whole survey again? Same sample size from the same population. 1,250 adults are taken. Redo it, given the same exact wording of the question. Am I going to keep getting 462 that will always say excellent in each sample that I take if I were to do it over and over again? No, you're not going to get necessarily 37% the next time. So then why are you even having confidence in this result? Why are we reporting that and saying, we think 37% of all adults would rate it as excellent? Because there's a margin of error that we have to allow for. And if we did it again, yes, we might get a different answer, but it's not going to vary all over the place. I'm not going to get all the way from 2% all the way up to 98%, I don't think. I think it's going to vary a little bit, hopefully, though, around the truth with a certain amount that you can quantify for me through that margin of error. So let's calculate what we call the 95% margin of error and connect that with our 37% to see what we can say. The margin of error was what again? Just 1 over the square root of your n. So what do we have for a margin of error if we do 1,250? About 0 0.028. If you were to do this over and over, yes, your sample proportions are going to vary. But we would expect them to only be off from the truth by no more than 2.8% most of the time, 95% of the time. 95% of the samples, if we were to do this over and over again, 95% of the samples are going to give you an answer for your survey that would be within 2.8% of the truth. Even though you don't know what the truth is, you know it should be reflecting that kind of accuracy. So rather than just reporting 37% and saying, I think that's what the true proportion is, why don't we give that little wiggle room around and report not just the actual estimate, but an <coughs> interval estimate instead. Let's go 37% and go out each way about this 2.8%. So what kind of range would we think is reasonable then? We would go down to 34, 34.2%. And we think it could be as high as how much? 39.8%. There's now a more reasonable range of where I think the true proportion might be. With 95% confidence, I give you that range as reasonable for what the true rate is. So you can still decide. Does it look like I have a majority? Uh, no way. Not only was 37% below, but it doesn't even get close to that 50% mark. Looks like I significantly have a minority who rated as excellent anyway. You can start making some decisions. Now this would be called our confidence interval, which is really better to think about than just the actual point estimate of 37%, because you know that's probably not the right answer. But I would consider any value in this range as being quite reasonable for what we think the true rate might be. And I could base decision making off of that. There's a couple of think about ideas. So this interval that we have goes from 34 to about 40%. Does it actually contain the true proportion? Is there anyone that knows the answer to that question? 
Does the interval from 34 to 39.8% contain the true P? To answer that, you would have to know the true proportion. And if you knew the true proportion, you don't have to go out and get data to estimate it then, because you already know the truth. So no one can answer that question unless you already have the truth for the population. You're just doing some simulations to see how well a process works. So we do not know whether our true population proportion is in this interval or not. It either is or it is not. And I can't tell you which is the case. There's no longer a 95% chance anymore either because the interval's already made and the true proportion's out there. It's some number, but it's not going to change. It doesn't vary. But I'm still confident in my result because I know that if I did do that interval over and over again, that procedure, if this procedure were repeated and produced lots of intervals each time, well, you know what? That value of P is going to be in 95% of the intervals. It's a good procedure. 95% of the time, it's going to give you an interval that has the true proportion in it. I just can't tell you for any one interval that's produced using this method whether it's a good one or not. But in the long run, most of the intervals out there that polling agencies are giving you do capture the true rate in them. So 95% of the time, they're making good decisions. About 5% of the time, they might make a wrong decision. But unless you know the truth, that's the best you can do. We'll talk more about this thing called the confidence level. It's called 95% confidence level. So we go into this in a little more detail later. But for right now, you have a pocket margin of error that you can always calculate. 1 over square root of n. And you can use that to form a range of values that's reasonable. For which then you might want to bring a calculator on Tuesday when we do our little practice quiz that I'm going to give you. I'm going to start off the day with a practice set of questions. I'm going to give you five to ten questions that are multiple choice on the topics we covered up through today to see how you're doing for you. I'll show you the distribution of answers afterwards. But for the first time going through, we're just going to let you try to answer each one. and You keep track and click in. And then you'll find out whether you're getting 100% or whether you missed one idea or one area and need to review that or not. So all you have to do is review your notes before next Tuesday, and you'll be fine to come in and try it. But bring a calculator in case you have to calculate a 1 over square root of n. All right, I'll let you try the bonus questions out, which have to do with that 1 over square root of n idea for at least part f. Those will be up this evening, the filled in notes. I'll put them in the files section. And then let's talk a little bit more about good sampling and not so good sampling. Some difficulties that can come up. And end today with the difference between an observational study and an experiment. So we talked about the fundamental rule for being able to use the data you've got to draw inference, that it's got to be representative. In a sense, we're trying to make sure that it is considered to be a random sample in some sense. Because there are good techniques and not so good techniques for gathering data. I mean, have you seen non-scientific polling done out there? In, um, shows that you're watching and they want you to call in with your opinion and they track that opinion right there. Well, that's a non-scientific poll because they didn't take a random sample of all adults. They just sampled from those who were watching the show and willing to take the time or pay the 50 cents to make the call in and give their opinion, which would be a very different group of people than a general random sample. Volunteer, self-selected, convenient samples are going to typically be biased. People who self-select either have a vested interest in that topic, have a strong opinion about that topic, or if they self-select or volunteer for a trial, clinical trial, it's because they have that condition that's hopefully going to have a treatment for it and they have a severe case of that condition more than just a mild one. So there's different issues. The good ones should give in some way everyone a non-zero chance, if possible, should be chance, of being selected. It should mimic what we call a random sample. So one of the things you're going to see in a list of assumptions for just about every testing of hypotheses or inference technique we do, got to have a random sample. You have to be able to consider the data you have as being looking like it's a random sample, representative of the larger population. So what do we really mean by saying it's a random sample? Random sample, mathematically, means IID. It means those observations you've got there are independent of each other, 
and identically distributed, IID. The independence kind of makes sense. You know, the answer you get from the first person you select in your survey, their answer should not influence what answer you'll get for the next person that you select or any other person. So independent just means those responses you're going to get from one individual don't influence responses you get from anyone else. So let's put in here, will not influence. Should be added in that blank space. That should have a line there, but it doesn't always. So that's usually reasonable. Identically distributed, you need to be able to consider that there was this population, this basket of everybody, and you picked a subset of that. That all the responses have the same model. They came from the same basket that has one model to describe all those values in that basket. Usually we don't gather the data all at one time point. It's usually over time that you have a study. Clinical trial protocol for who can qualify for it. They come in, they meet the protocol, they go through the treatment, and you're measuring them along the way. And you have results across the way. You've gathered data across the way. So often the data is not collected from one basket, but actually a sequence of populations that you're really taking data from. Can you treat all those baskets as looking alike? They all have the same basic model behind them. So we're going to add here a little note. We will use time plots. One of the plots you'll see in lab two to check this. If you did gather your data over time, then let's make a time plot, a plot of the observations you gathered over time to see whether or not there was any trend that over time things seem to increase or decrease, well then you really can't put it all together because it wasn't collected. There's something else that's going on to generate that trend. So we'll be checking that out with time plots. More on that than later in lab two. I like this example. I did an independent study a number of years ago now where I had a small group of students and we read Tainted Truth. A little outdated with some of the examples in there, but it's still got some good research that was done on how surveys can be biased. One of them is that you ask people, and if they don't know what you're really talking about, they still might answer the question. Asking the uninformed. People do not like to admit that they don't know what you're talking about. They still answer. So they did some studies where they checked this out, the extent to which people do that. And they had a listing of some ethnic groups, and they were asked to rate them in certain ways and talk about them or select the ones that they think are more prominent an issue or whatever. But one of them was made up and put in the list, and people still had opinions about them. 30% of them still had an opinion about this group, the Wissians, and even rated them when they had to do a ranking higher than some others that are definitely ethnic groups. So there are some extents of which they measure the extent of bias in some things. They go through a lot when they vet a survey. Surveys are not just written up and put right out there. They are gone through to make sure that the questions are worded clearly, that the order of the question won't make a difference. Lots of details behind designing a survey. All right, your one picture of the day, actually two side by side. Another way to characterize how we learn, we talk about surveys. They're a particular type of observational study. So we learn by observation, and we learn by experimentation. That's my oldest. Mm -hmm. So observational studies and experiments. That's the main classification for the types of studies that are done out there. Surveys fall into the first one. You're, sur you're very simply asking questions of your participants about opinions, outcomes, behaviors. Not asking them to do something differently, then you're doing an observational study. So surveys are one type of that. If you are manipulating something in the study, if you're assigning some of the people in your study to one particular treatment and everyone else gets this other treatment, a standard one or maybe a placebo, then you're designing an experiment. Often in an experiment, the researcher is imposing something on the subjects. Perhaps they're designing it with a control group in mind so that some get the actual treatment, some don't, so that they can know whether or not the placebo effect is going to make an issue here because people respond to any treatment. 
And so you have to measure that placebo effect in the control group so you can take it away from the treatment group people. So experiments versus observational studies. All of the studies are going to have variables that they measure. And we've already talked about the types of variables being categorical or quantitative, but what role do they play in the study is typically broken down to being either an explanatory variable, the variable that might explain why you're seeing this response variable of interest, the main outcome of interest. So we might say, here's a variable in the study. What role is it playing, explanatory or response? And what type of variable is it, categorical or quantitative, to know how we'll summarize it? Then there are these other variables. There's lots of variables out there that we still might measure. I might measure age, weight, whether or not you had a heart attack in the past or not in my clinical trial, because that might be important. It might influence the response and maybe be tied to the explanatory too. These variables may not be of primary interest, but they can affect the response, so I better measure them and control for them then, or count for them. And they're called the confounding variable. Because they can influence the response, and I have two groups, they got the treatment, they didn't. Suppose this group was a higher rate of males compared to females, and males are known to respond in a certain way. Is the differences I'm seeing in my two groups because there were more males in this group compared to this one, or is it because that treatment's better? I don't know what's the difference. I can't separate the effect of the treatment out from this other variable that also could confound things. So confounding variables are the ones that are typically measured in a study so you can control for them, but they're not the main explanatory variable of interest, but you've got to make sure you account for them. Variables that are out there that would do the same thing, they'll relate to both your explanatory and your response and can mess things up, but you don't know about them, are called lurking variables. And sometimes after a study is conducted, there can be some research that finds out that you know, this could have been a lurking variable in that design, so we should include that in the next phase to be able to account for it. You get more of an issue in observational studies with confounding. Confounding most likely is going to affect observational studies, so they don't help to give evidence for cause and effect as much as an experiment can. Because experiments, you randomize. Treatment group, control group, Let's randomly assign our subjects to one or the other so that each group should be balanced with respect to gender, with respect to age, or anything else you might possibly think could be a confounder. Even if you don't measure it, it should be balanced by the randomization. So things should cancel out when you compare the two groups. All right, there's one example that I'll let you try tonight, this weekend, when you review your notes. The filled in versions will go up this afternoon. But let's look out at this one last one and decide whether we have an experiment here or not. Look at some of the variables that are being measured, and what role they're playing. So this is looking at external clues. Basically, they were interested in looking at the impact of the color that your exam is printed on. And then, of course, the type of questions that are asked, whether they were, you have to explain them, or whether it was multiple choice, perhaps, for harder versus easier on exam score. So they had four different forms. The first two forms were on the same color of paper, a light blue, but they had either difficult questions or the more simply stated questions. And then the other two forms were on a different color paper, like a light pink, and they again had the different types of questions. The researchers are going to randomly assign their undergraduates in the class to one of these four groups send them to four different rooms and to go take their midterm with that respective combination for their exam. So what are we doing here? Are we conducting an observational study or are we looking at a designed experiment here? Did the researchers part of the study impose some treatment on the subjects? Yeah, a particular combination of the color of the paper and the type of questions that were asked. It is a randomized experiment. If they didn't randomly allocate them, if they just did it by lab section or something without randomization, then it wouldn't be a randomized experiment, but still an experiment. So it is a randomized experiment. We've got a couple variables being measured and then this exam score at the end. So of those variables being measured, one of them is the color of the paper. What kind of role is it playing in this designed experiment? 
Is it a response of interest, or is it this thing that might be explaining that response? It's doing the explaining. Potentially the color of the paper, they think, might influence the outcome. That color of the paper being either the blue or the red is going to be of which type then it is? Categorical. What's another explanatory variable in the model here? The other one is the type of questions with two levels also. And the final variable here, exam score, of course, is your main response or outcome of interest. How well you understand the content measured by an exam score. And its type is back to now quantitative. Good. All right. Well, what if? In this random assignment, it still turned out that the students who took the blue form of the exam, exam on blue paper, were mainly upperclassmen. And the students that were in the other two groups, taking the other color of the paper, were really freshmen and sophomores. That variable then, class rank, is a variable in the study, and it could be recorded. But what kind of variable is it here? Is it response? Is it explanatory? Or what was another one that we just learned? Confounding. It's an example of a confounding variable. It wasn't the primary variable that we think might do the explaining, although we know that maybe freshmen coming in haven't had a college exam yet compared to upperclassmen who have experienced some college exams could make a difference. If they didn't measure this, then what could happen? Those in the blue group, they get better on average, compared to those who took the pink or red exam. Oh, so blue must be better over red. Not necessarily. It could be because of this other variable. That variable is influencing the outcome, perhaps, and that could be what's really doing the differences here. And I can't separate it out without measuring this variable. So measuring it allows me to maybe do some adjustment.